We are ready. Everything is okay. So, uh, uh, do you want a off screen? Yeah, Otherwise, what you can do, you can turn and let you over in this area. Is it is right it better? Yes. <laughs> Professor from UC Irvine. He has more than 250 published papers in journals and conferences, and he was the previous uh, president of uh, IPOE. And he's going to talk about creating open like So, Professor, please. Thank you, Alfredo, for the kind invitation. I'm so happy you invited me. I would not have this for the world. I, was, I, I gave this. A similar presentation yesterday at a conference in Natal, and uh, I, I was sandwiched between lunch and the game. <laughs> so that was not a, not a very good position to this year. And uh, so yesterday I was constrained to one hour. So today I think I'll go all the way to five o'clock, maybe six o'clock. <laughs> I'm going to constrain my remarks to, uh, to about one hour. So yes, uh, indeed, my name is Jean-Luc Goliot, and uh, as you can tell with a name like this, uh, I'm not Irish. I'll let you guess what that could be. Um, so uh, it's pronounced like rodeo. Yeah, my wife is an American born and raised. When she had to introduce me to her parents, she had to tell them how to pronounce that god awful name. It's pronounced like rodeo. Be that as it may, uh, I'd like to talk to you about some of the work I've been doing with a former student of mine. Uh, his name is Shaoshan Lu. He's actually uh, founded his uh, own uh, startup, which is halfway between China and the Silicon Valley. We are coming to this angle, uh, to, to, to this work, uh, on something that uh, Marco and, uh, and Alfredo know very well, namely the, the hybrid computing, parallel computing systems that uh, we have been uh, working on, and uh, we'll see how that fits in to the uh, creation of autonomous computing systems. Um, then there's, uh, I, I don't mean to give you answers, I mean to give you an overview and uh, perhaps a lot of questions. Uh, the, Goal of the, these projects, if you will, because it's uh, multiple projects, is to create, as it says here, autonomous vehicle systems. Uh, that means that for the moment, we're not quite looking at things such as vehicle platooning. We are looking at things that are completely independent. We don't rely upon uh, other vehicles to tell them where the others are, where their intentions are. Obviously, that would be quite a bit of, uh, of an improvement. However, uh, it would require a lot more um, 
work in terms of standards, in terms of communication, in terms of ethical, and there's a whole bunch of issues. And by the way, uh, one thing that I, I'd like to emphasize here is even though some of it will look like a solved problem, none of it is really. Uh, at the end, I'll show you a system that does a 15 mile per hour uh, small vehicle. Um, but in order to make sure that we can implement an autonomous vehicle system fleet, we're going to have a lot more work eventually in terms of uh, ethics, of standards, legal issues, all these are going to have to be solved. Um, and by the way, I'd like to remind you, since you mentioned the, the IEEE Computer Society, I'm going to have a word of advertising. Uh, the, uh, the Computer Society is very strong in a number of things, you know, publications, you know, the transactions, you know, the, uh, the conferences, but it also has a lot of activity in terms of standards. And there's at least one standard that probably everybody in this room is currently using. You know what that, what that one is? It's 802.11. Every time you have a, uh, a connection to a Wi Fi system, it's an IEEE 802.11 that came out of the computer society. The point I'm trying to make is uh, those standards don't come out of big IEEE or IEEE computer society in the sky. They come out of people like you. So if you are working on some aspect of uh, engineering or science and uh, you feel that there's a need to for standards, which is what we are going to be talking at some point, talking about at some point, you uh, you should by all means come up and drum up support from uh, other people who are thinking or think alike, so that you can create those standards. So that's my word of advertising for the computer society. Other, I can also go on and on about the uh, student chapters, but. I'm not well, this is not the only advertisement I'm going to have. Here is a monograph that uh, we have published with my former students. You can barely see my former student, the Shao Shen, and here is the Irishman at the bottom. Uh, we have published also a number of uh, papers. You can find them in, uh, in IEEE Computer Magazine. Uh, it's actually the flagship of, uh, of the Computer Society. Just listing this one for measuring that period. Um, last year in August. Okay, so uh, what's this talk going to be about? Well, first we're going to obviously have uh, the state of the art. Uh, we'll be discussing then what, uh, again, and I'm going to bring you up to what the problems are. But this that I put a lot of question marks here. Uh, I'm going to put some of the problems and some of the possible solutions. Uh, the second problem, obviously, is for the vehicle to determine where it is. Uh, we'll then try to make sure that the vehicle understands the environment. It's not enough to say this is my lap long uh, coordinates. And then you have to know well, you know, which, what is around it. Do we have cars? Do we have pedestrians? Do we have whatever? Um, as a subset, if you will, of perception, we have deep learning, which is another form of decision making. We'll talk about that. In more detail, then of course, once you know where you are, you got to decide where are you going to go and how are you going to get there. That's the planning and control. And how do we implement all this? What is the hardware and software support, the client systems? That's again, as I mentioned, uh, where Alfredo and Marcus come in. That's the, the work we've been doing on parallel processing, excuse me, parallel processing using hybrid uh, computation. Uh, then there is a great need to communicate, to uh, get the world to benefit from the experience of this car, but there's a bit of crowdsourcing. And conversely, there's a lot of simulation that you must do. You must simulate the heck out of those things, get uh, have beta testing out there on the freeway. That's going to be very nice for your environment. And then, unless uh, Everybody's asleep, or Alfredo beats me on the head and says you two hours over your time. I will try to discuss uh, a case study. We'll call it uh, edge computing. Okay, so here it is with uh, our overview. Um, let's talk about the various 
eras that we have experience in computing. Well, back in, uh, in, in the old days, that's uh, some of us. Uh, remember it, this is an Intel 8080, that's the first microprocessor that <coughs> I worked on way back in 1975. <coughs> and uh, so that was manufactured by Intel. Intel. And uh, the reason why we have Fairchild here is because we had, uh, that, that's uh, where Gordon Moore was at the time when he uh, promulgated his uh, famous law, which is actually not a law, it's more of a self-fulfilling prophecy, but it's an entirely different talk. Uh, so I, I'm just going to skip that. But uh, that's the, the first era. We just suddenly were able to plot everything all the computing power that we had at the time, we were able to plot it on one single chip, and that's where uh, things started happening. It started happening from the 80s to the millennium, where uh, companies actually used these, uh, these chips, put them into some boxes, and made them useful, uh, either software or, uh, or in hardware. I'm sorry, I'm turning around. Uh, my flight was at 4 a.m. out of the town. This is ungodliness. Uh, so, uh, the, the software, of course, Microsoft and Apple. But this, it, it's interesting, by the way, you notice how uh, logos become simpler and simpler. See the logo for Apple now? And that, that was the original logo for Apple. But in the future, it's probably going to be just a circle. <laughs> uh, but, uh, the point here is that the, the ability to have everything under an operating system that uh, was understood and agreed upon by everybody was actually uh, a major, uh, major step forward. And up to that point, there, there, were, there were a lot of companies that tried to put micro, micro computers on the market, but they each had their own operating system, and with CPM, I remember others. Uh, until something could be agreed upon uh, or agreed upon by the market uh, and have the, uh, the communications that we have to get today. And indeed, this is what happened between 20, 2000 and 2010. We had the appearance of uh, number of companies such as Google and here this Google Maps. So it started, uh, as you know, uh, taking on some, uh, some speed some steam, rather, and uh, the next five years, well, it, uh, we grew and grew, and uh, things such as uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, all the social media that you may want to, to imagine happening the next, and uh, built upon all that, now you've seen things such as Uber, I'm not sure, uh, does Uber uh, operate in Brazil? Yeah. So, uh, such as Uber, Lyft, and all those companies, Airbnb, and whatever uh, social interaction you want to imagine is underneath this picture. Uh, well, from now on, wouldn't it be nice if uh, Uber had uh, self-driving cars? That's what we're going to uh, look at here. Uh, or uh, Airbnb had, uh, you know, offered a self-cleaning or robots that would be cleaning your, your accommodation ahead of time. Those are. Uh, the way I see the errors, the various errors in computing. Um, okay, so that means that we have to put uh, together a number. I don't know why the, uh, this came out here. It must be PC versus Mac. And I, I, I did say that we, had, we were in agreement. Well, maybe. Uh, so the, what are the various robotics technology that we're going to be discussing in the coming AI? Era, well, there is uh, the slang, we will discuss that, that's used for uh, localization and conventional neural networks and, uh, and long term, uh, long short term memory approaches for the interaction. So, uh, what we have here is uh, the two different things you know, the, the anatomy and the physiology of those things, um, which uh, lead us from one algorithm to the next discuss that in more uh, details, and eventually at the level of the interaction with the actual vehicle, we have uh, those uh, different uh, 
animals down here that would eventually result in an action. Um, putting it all together, I called it the capstone here. The BMW has this uh, very nice uh, looking beamer here that uh, can do a number of things. Uh, first, if we look at the level of the, the algorithms here, we have uh, to look at the sensing, which can be a GPS, it be LiDAR, it can be a camera. There are other sensors that you can imagine, and I'll discuss those. Uh, and then eventually all this is going to go to the uh, client system. And the last level, I didn't mention it, I think it was number six or number seven in my outline slide, would be uh, the cloud uh, platform, which includes things such as HD maps, model training, uh, simulation. Simulation is, as I mentioned before, very, very important. Any kind of new algorithm, you're going to have to, to simulate it make sure that it operates well and it operates safely, of course. Okay, so uh, going uh, vertically here, the, the sensing, as I already uh, alluded to, involves <laughs> things that will help you localize your, your machine. Uh, then that would be passed on to the perception that requires not only the localization you may have done out of the sensing, but also re recognize objects and track objects. It's not enough to know that there is a pedestrian here. You have to know that the pedestrian has moved and kind of predict their uh, track. Uh, I assume that there will be some uh, uh, ethical issues involved in that. Uh, in California, we're very respectful of pedestrians. I assume that in Boston, the algorithm would be different. You aim for the pedestrian. <laughs> What are you doing, Brazil? <laughs> don't answer. Don't answer that. Uh, and then uh, uh, at the level of decision, uh, we in all these uh, terms, you will see them again as uh, press path planning, action prediction, and uh, obstacle avoidance. Okay, so back to where we started with earlier localization. That's obviously the most crucial uh, task of autonomous driving. You don't know where you are, you don't know where you're going. Okay, So we certainly have to know where we are as the localization. And there are a variety of solutions. Uh, the one that you're probably most familiar with uh, is, uh, is GPS. It's everything that's satellite-based. Uh, but there are some areas. There, there, there is GPS satellite-based, but there's also other things such as LiDAR, vision, Geometry, we're going to be discussing this. So, uh, the, the SLAM pipeline here is an interesting, uh, it's, it's how we would start, we would start, say, with an IMU, which is our inertial navigation system, or the, the inertial that allows you to, to know what you're doing, and the camera, which would uh, situate you within the environment, and the update here would allow you to do some mapping. Uh, the, uh, uh, okay, so I'm just going to fix this stack very quickly. The, th this is, by the way, pretty much the same way that we function. We have an uh, inertial uh, navigation system, a three, uh, 3D type of, uh, of gyroscopes in our internal ear, uh, but we correlate it with the vision. And uh, as you know that I'm uh, an aviation enthusiast, and they say, that a pilot who is not trained for instrument flying, if that pilot penetrates the cloud and stays there, that pilot has about 179 seconds on average to live because uh, it gets jostled in the cloud. Then uh, the internal ear is not uh, constantly uh, calibrated by the vision. Eventually, you'll come out of the clouds and burn. So that's not a nice thing. But uh, again, uh, what I'm trying to, to, to show here is the solution is never, rarely, a single solution. You have to have multiple, <coughs> multiple approaches that allow you to, uh, to cross-correlate, to, to calibrate what you get with one sensor with the other one. 
Okay, so uh, GPS, GPS, as you know, you probably have observed it uh, yourself in your car, uh, has a number of uh, errors. Uh, some of them in here, they're listed satellite clocks, orbit errors, ionospheric delays, atmospheric delays, receiver noise, and multipath and things to balance up of uh, things. Uh, on the average, on a good day, you'll get uh, a five meter radius uh, precision. That's clearly not sufficient for uh, driving, for staying within the lane. I don't know, maybe in Boston. <laughs> <laughs> don't tell my friends that in Boston. <laughs> um, so, uh, what, what, what are the, the solutions? Okay, in, in aviation, uh, there are two, uh, two terms. There is WAS, which is Wide Area Augmentation System and local area augmentation systems, some of the variations of which are presented here. What it is, is uh, local area is you have a fixed receiver, the position of which is very well known. So the receiver knows what the air of the satellite currently is and broadcasts it so that the, uh, the unit out there, you can uh, deduct the air and get much better precision. There's wide area, excuse me. Uh, so yeah, the, before I move on, this is good, uh, but each base station will cover on a good day only a few miles, and uh, it requires tens of thousands of stations. In a, uh, a better system that uh, requires uh, no uh, base station, um, it is possible to have a connection, uh, like I said, wide area where the errors are detected and are calculated and are broadcast by the satellite in geosynchronous orbit. Uh, in general, this is uh, this uh, suffers. What happened here? That's again Mac versus PC. Uh, the, uh, it, it sometimes requires a, a very long startup time, and that could be a, indeed a problem. Uh, but we can uh, uh, alleviate that by leaving things uh, dormant. Okay, so uh, there is another reason why you might want to use an INS. It's not just to position yourself uh, within 3D, but also to localize. Okay? And uh, you can supplement an inertial navigation system by GPS and vice versa. In the year, not so long ago, that's what airliners would use. They had an inertial navigation system, but on a distance such as crossing the Atlantic, the, the air was uh, a few miles, so it had to be corrected eventually. Um, so uh, if we uh, like not GPS, GNSS, because there are many, there are several GPS systems that are available. Uh, we know that it's relatively accurate, but it has. Uh, also a relatively low uh, sampling frequency, and sometimes it will become unavailable. So uh, the INS uh, inertial navigation system can come in to supplement what we pick up as uh, GPS at a much higher sampling frequency, but of course, as we know, a lower accuracy. So you know, just uh, get the both uh, the best from both uh, in some kind of a common filtering arrangement. And here is a self-fulfilling question here. Is the combination enough? And indeed, for our purposes, it is uh, enough. Uh, I see that people are taking pictures. I can uh, just drop me a note. I'll send you the slides. Okay. And the, uh, my email is uh, that Irish name <laughs> at, at uci.edu. I, I also have slides. So as we get into deeper and deeper now, just not just a position on the map, even uh, 3D, we want to know what's surrounding us. A great way of doing that is uh, to have a, a LiDAR unit. LiDAR unit is essentially something that's on, the, on, the, on your rooftop, or would be on your rooftop if you had uh, one such uh, unit, and it's fairly big, and it actually paints very rapidly around with the laser beam to get a picture of the environment 
which it uh, compares to an HD map, so that it knows very precisely where it is. Uh, that requires the concept of uh, layered maps that we have uh, outlined here, starting from the bottom up. Uh, we start uh, with a 2D, uh, uh, 2D grid map that has a 5 centimeter by 5 centimeter resolution. And then we start adding road reference lines. Uh, we start uh, adding uh, lane information. We uh, have other semantic features, and eventually we have our uh, complete, uh, complete understanding of the, of the environment. Notice, uh, by the way, that in order to know, to be able to read the signals, we're going to need some kind of account. So uh, that's going to require some very high refresh rate of the information about the environment. Uh, a few months ago, I was driving around and a GPS led me in front of a sign that said uh, road close. Well, clearly, GPS didn't know where I was going. And he was getting very upset as I started going away from it. He said, Go back, go back. <laughs> uh, so, that uh, requires also very high precision and uh, very good integration with the client systems. More on this uh, later. Uh, now, obviously, uh, you can also figure out with just your eyes where you're going, and uh, you can have a stereo vision, and by the way, again, I'm going to talk about flying. Um, a lot of people think that in order to get a depth perception, uh, you need two eyes, and uh, actually, uh, I'm blind in one eye, and I have uh, 3,000 light hours, so I think if I couldn't tell, uh, depth, you would know about it. Uh, also, I have no problems grabbing my calculator. <laughs> <laughs> the first, first one, or the second. Well, <laughs> then, then, then there's a problem with the INS inside my ear. <laughs> okay, so uh, you can uh, apply things such as uh, visual geometry that are going to allow you to uh, detect what your motion is with regard to the environment, and will uh, provide you with the cable position. So you can have stereo visual geometry with less precision. You know, if you have uh, mono. Uh, you can add uh, inertial information uh, for more frequent updates. And but the problem of odometry as it's based upon your, uh, can also be based not just on uh, your vision, but also on your wheels, is uh, the wheel odometry that depends on the geometry of your vehicle. Here we have a, a four, <coughs> four wheel thing, here we have a tricycle, here we have one with very, uh, very small casters, it's a typo here, um, very small casters, but the pro problem of slippage, bouncing, and things like that can come into uh, picture and upset your uh, your understanding of how far you're going. So the point I'm making here again is that all these techniques have to come. I'm not competing. They are. They have to support one another, and we have to understand exactly where the errors are, so we can correct them accordingly. So, uh, here they are. We're doing sensor fusion with hate marks. The uh, sensor fusion uh, with LiDAR. Uh, so, that means that we would have somewhere a, uh, an IMS uh, here, a wheel, and a GPS, and a LiDAR. And we come together, give us the pose. Pose, in this case, uh, means uh, the position of the vehicle, but also its direction direction in which it is pointing. Uh, this has been implemented, and you remember back, uh, I want to say about 15 years ago, uh, the uh, DARPA Grand Challenge was exactly that. DARPA had to put together uh, a challenge where you had to go from point A to point B somewhere in, uh, in the Mojave Desert, northeast of, uh, of LA, and they would tell you where it was A, they would tell you where it was B until the last moment, and you had to make sure that your car to navigate that. <coughs> so all this uh, really comes out of that. Notice that here we have uh, all these 
four cars have a LiDAR on top of them, which is that in their side lane. Uh, the Stanford entry, the CMU entry, uh, the, uh, the Google car, and uh, the Baidu entry. Uh, this is the one that we're working most with now because, uh, as I mentioned earlier, my student has uh, this uh, startup in China. Well, yeah, that's very nice, but LiDARs are very expensive. They're uh, tens of thousands of dollars, and uh, that's ends up being doubling the price of a, of a small car. We really, really can't do that. So why don't we do uh, cameras? And the cameras is something that other uh, places, and I'm not trying to say that there are no other uh, experiments, there are no other projects. I'm just showing you two projects here, uh, the Mercedes-Benz Bertha and uh, the Tesla that are surrounded by cameras and understand their environment from Itself. So, uh, if we compare vision uh, versus LiDAR, here is a camera and here is a LiDAR unit, uh, it, it tends to have lower robustness, uh, for one thing, it rains, a number of things, if there is fog, uh, that could cause some problems. However, it's much more affordable, cameras are really very cheap. Uh, we have one that's here, that's probably a hundred bucks, I would say. Uh, and, uh, it doesn't necessarily, uh, I shouldn't say that it's not necessary, but HD maps are not completely necessary. But uh, in the, to, to, to aid in localization, it really would uh, help. Uh, on the other hand, LiDAR is proven, I just mentioned to you the, uh, the Power by Ryan challenge. However, they're very expensive, and those absolutely depend on HD maps. Okay, so continuing along, there is, uh, set up for ourselves, we have uh, section three, perception. Which really means the understanding of, of the environment, because there are things that are, as I said, uh, added to the environment. Remember when we first want to localize, we say, okay, I know I am here, there's a tree over there, and those, those are well-defined uh, uh, things. But uh, they are the, the non-invariance and are things such as pedestrian cyclists, all these uh, vehicle or some other vehicle uh, recognition. Uh, in some cases, you may want to recognize the road structure. And very importantly, you have to identify, I should say traffic lights, I should say traffic sign. Uh, you want to be able to recognize them and identify them as such and detect the moving objects. So here again, I'm going to go through a number of techniques that are possible. Uh, one of the things uh, that we have to do is, as usual, we have to do appropriate testing. Appropriate testing, uh, there are some defined data sets, these benchmarks, if you will, that have been proposed here. Kitty data set comes from uh, the University of Karlsruhe and Toyota. Uh, that provide us with a number of scenarios, many, many scenarios, and uh, testing yourself, testing your system against a known set of benchmarks is quite important. Um, this uh, here uh, will do the stereo and optical flow visual pedometry from the from orientation, uh, object tracking, and, uh, and road uh, parsing uh, would be Parts of this, you know, the others uh, come in addition. Um, okay, object detection. Object detection, most of the time, what we can do is we can uh, start with a number of basic templates a bunch of small cars, a bunch of medium cars, a bunch of etc., etc., uh, different colors, different orientations, different. Occlusion also, and uh, that's what eventually, you know, if you pass these templates uh, over your image, will uh, let you identify where the cars are. Um, so that means uh, here I'm implying that we're discussing rigid objects that provide uh, this kind of, uh, of identification. Uh, well, if we have non rigid object, uh, I'd like to think I'm not. Objects. Okay. Uh, 
uh, you have to, to parse them down to things that are uh, rich in superstitions, or or whatever uh, that you can finally uh, identify as being a person, to being a psychist, or what have you. Okay, so the next step is uh, segmentation. The, the goal of which is to assign meaning to the objects. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we have to be sure this is a car, this is a pedestrian, this is a traffic signal, what have you. Um, that's uh, where the, the technique that uh, CSS is a so called uh, conditional or uh, random field that, uh, again, uh, has uh, four. Basic technique has to do with the scanning of the whole area and finding the, those regions of, uh, of interest. More on this uh, shortly. Um, we've already discussed in some other context stereo, optical flow, and scene flow. And by the way, optical flow is probably the way I get my depth perception because if I move a little bit, then you move at a different rate than she does behind. That gives me the depth perception that I need. So that's a way to get that perception, and uh, it should indeed be used uh, to our benefit because we are moving. We are in a car, we're moving, and all those things uh, move in different ways. Um, so those are the, the techniques that we would want to use, either stereo vision, optical flow, or vision. Um, scene flow will be a more complicated uh, operation that would allow us to physically understand the motion of the, of the object between two pairs of stereo images from T plus one. Uh, object tracking, well here you have an example of objects that have been picked up. They have picked up three humans. Yes, pesky humans. Uh, we have uh, three humans, uh, red, green, and blue, but as time uh, goes, then both uh, red and green go behind uh, blue, and they reappear. So, of course, you don't want to, you want to clearly identify that, to understand that here you may have lost uh, green and blue, uh, yeah, no, I'm sorry, uh, green and red. Anyway, you may have lost those two here, but you want to reacquire them, and this is what this uh, uh, this uh, state transition diagram uh, represents. So you're going to be able to track them, and how do you track them? You track them by uh, time. Okay, you, can, you can estimate the speed at which uh, those objects will move and when they should reappear. Deep learning is my favorite, and I'll tell you why in a few seconds. Uh, it's computational neural networks or visions to convert raw images into useful features. Uh, the reason why it is my favorite is that it was invented by someone named Jan Lecun, uh, 1988, I believe, and uh, he's actually a graduate of my uh, alma mater in Paris. I just wanted to mention that there are some good elements that come out here. <laughs> Okay, so the pipeline that we would want to go through as uh, we do a scene understanding uh, starts uh, with the convolutional uh, convolution layer that extracts features from the inputs that are then activated, function to determine whether the signal should be activated or not. And uh, there's a pooling layer that actually tends to uh, put things together at that layer. And the last layer is the so-called fully connected layer, which is the complete integration. And uh, uh, that's uh, what you would have observed in regular neural networks, such as uh, your multi-layer perceptron. Uh, there are additional techniques that will increase the speed of, uh, of the relational neural networks. Uh, there's the RCNN, uh, which first would obtain a region of interest in performed classification. Uh, it is uh, considered highly accurate, however, it may be too slow for our uh, applications. Uh, another one here that has to do with uh, the 
narrowing down of the, uh, of the accuracy. Uh, it tends to generate objects in one pass. It's also higher. Uh, it's also highly accurate. It's faster, but it is also computationally uh, expensive. Uh, to continue with uh, semantic segmentation, other techniques include things such as the period scene uh, parsing network that uh, I have on right here. Again, those are all based on uh, some form uh, variations of neural networks. And the, uh, the pretty pictures here indicate how we have gone from uh, the input image to the final image that uh, breaks down the, uh, the various components of the image. Um, we mentioned stereo vision. Stereo vision at some point is going to require that the identifications be matched so that we know exactly what the distances uh, are. So there are essentially two branches to the convolutional convolution layers. Uh, there's one for each image, and eventually you join the results, uh, the join the, the outputs to generate the, the result. And that uh, will reduce uh, the error to about 50, by about 50 percent if you compare it to SGM. Very expensive. All this is highly computationally expensive, and that's where our work uh, will come in. We'll use some, uh, some hints here. Uh, more <coughs> variations on the neural nets. So uh, is it your flow net for optical flow that uh, would also uh, allow us to understand the uh, perceive our environment, optical flow, feature extraction, local matching, local optimization. Uh, they are two major phases. First, you shrink and then uh, you expand to reduce the resolution. Again, very highly computationally. Okay, so now we know where we are. We uh, know what's around us and who they are, or what, what they are. Now we need to know what we're going to be doing with that. That's the decision making. And uh, here you may recognize, or you may have an inkling of what, what I'm uh, representing here. We're starting to talk about the architecture, not necessarily in terms of physical architecture, but also in terms of the relationship of the various uh, software modules that we have. And here, uh, we would have uh, the uh, narrower concept in the red of uh, planning and control, and here the larger concept. And down here is actually essentially the actual implementation layer. Uh, perception, uh, perception is uh, over there. Localization and mapping is uh, for the uh, real time uh, position. Uh, and uh, the canvas is the Bus essentially that connects to the actual, uh, actual control units. Um, within this, within the, the, the blue here, we have prediction, routing, uh, self explanatory, the decisions, what, what are we going to be doing? Motion planning, it's not enough to say I want to go over there. You have to maybe go around the pedestrian, or if you're in Boston, go through the pedestrian. Uh, and that's the, the high level uh, decision. Uh, I could have said Paris. Paris also. Uh, and so you need to plan your motion, and, uh, and then the low level control mechanisms that will allow you to detect that motion. Uh, action prediction here. Uh, yeah, this one's better. Uh, we have a pedestrian here, and the, the darker it is the more confident we are of our prediction. We know that the pedestrian here from here likely is going to be here, 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 at such and such times into the future. Uh, again, uh, and this is not a joke, um, there are some cultural aspects that will come in. In Switzerland, I understand that if a pedestrian as much as puts a toe on the asphalt and you drive through, you li you're liable to get a ticket. So people are very careful that if they see a pedestrian 10 feet away from the curb, they'll stop. 
So there are some uh, some cultural aspects that we want to connect. Here <coughs> is another situation where if you were observing this car, suppose you say here, you're observing this car. Well, and, uh, and it's uh, at this point here. You, you have no idea whether it's going to go straight or turn left until it actually starts the operations of motion. So in this case, you might have to maintain two hypotheses. Um, within lanes, you're probably going to have some rotting issues that will come in. And you've got uh, to look at several different algorithms I've listed them here. Um, it essentially, those, uh, those algorithms consist of breaking down the, the lanes in little segments that are connected, trying to, uh, to solve a, a graph connectivity problem. Uh, this, uh, uh, this is probably something that I want to skip at this point. This is more, more decisions in here. is an illustration of what happens <coughs> when we want to switch lanes. Do uh, we want to accelerate? Do we have a car coming here? Do we want to switch lane? We have decided to switch lanes. Do we want to accelerate or let that one pass? So on and so forth. But there are a number of decisions that need to be made as the individual scenario uh, that will require uh, us to understand, understand uh, within the coordinate S and L here what is the path and what are the different possible paths that you may want to take. Um, so then we're planning the motion where this is uh, the trajectory of the generation. The feedback control has to do with <coughs> to a lot with the odometry and the uh, and mechanical structure of your vehicle. For example, here with a bicycle, and that's going to be something that you can have to implement according to the vehicle of your, your the geometry of your vehicle. Okay, so uh, client systems. So we're going to put all this together and we've got to uh, implement it onto physical hardware. Uh, obviously, we're going to need some very robust operating system. <coughs> and uh, it's not only robust in terms of uh, the possibility of failures, possibility of hiccups, but it also uh, has to be void also in terms of security. Uh, we won't let any Russian hackers in. <laughs> uh, but uh, be that as it may, uh, there is also robustness in terms of the computational demands. Uh, if you have a one camera that transmits uh, 60, frame per, <coughs> 60 frames per second, and you have therefore 16 milliseconds for each frame, and that's for each camera. I remember the, the bands that we had had zillions of cameras all around it. So you can multiply this. And uh, so there are uh, some things out there in the, in the open uh, source of the robot operating system. Uh, however, that one uh, is a little bit fragile. Uh, communication tends to be a bottleneck and it is uh, not very secure. Um, in terms of, so we have, uh, so those are the requirements. Remember, I told you I wasn't going to provide necessarily solutions, I'm providing problems. Uh, I'm sure there are some PhD students here, okay? Get to work. Um, the computing platform, computing and control platform, is really where uh, we came in or we are coming in. Uh, if you look at even something fairly uh, computational intensive such as CPU with 8 to 16 uh, GPUs here with 8. Uh, that's going to, pro to, to cost a lot in terms of heat dissipation. It's going to be very expensive and, uh, I'm sorry, high power consumption. And also the heat dissipation, it's uh, going to require a tank of water behind to make sure that you can uh, dissipate the heat provided by this little guy. So uh, what we looked at is mobile, much simpler mobile systems on the chip. Here, a mobile system that has a quad core CPU uh, with a hexagon a DSP and a GPU. 
This results in a peak power of about 15 watts. And uh, notice that here, if you compare the performance to energy, uh, A is, uh, oh yeah, A is uh, uh, feature, no, I'm sorry, convolution, and this is feature extraction task. So in this case, uh, very clearly, the performance uh, is not uh, what you want. The energy here is probably very high, but maybe a good uh, uh, trade off would be the DSP. Whatever, just pointing to the fact that uh, there are trade offs and that specialized processors are really what you want to observe. And here we have something very simple CPU, DSP, GPU, but you could imagine FPGAs. Imagine A6, uh, FPGA is being probably very good for uh, security issues because security is a move, moving target and you have to adapt to it, you know, update in the middle of the night. Um, but the point is, those uh, hybrid computing systems are much better. They tend to provide you with the computing power. And this is uh, where, again, the work that Alfredo Marcos and I have been working on uh, hybrid computing systems. Um, one of the things that one of our colleagues has invented, which I call uh, just in case computing, you heard of just in time compilation. Well, we do just in case compilation, which means that if you have n types of processors available to you, uh, Obviously, a piece of code is going to be optimal for some type. But suppose by the time it comes time to execute, that this code, that, that this type is not available. Well, you may want to start executing on something that's less optimal, but still will make your computation pro progress. But to that end, you need, <coughs> you need to have compiled for multiple types of processors. Okay, so the, the wrap up of this discussion is we're going to need a specialized operating system or middleware, and we need to design optimized and lightware hardware to meet our performance and power and cost requirements. This wouldn't be complete if we didn't look at the higher level, the high level, that's what I call putting it all together and designing a cloud, uh, a cloud plat platform to support uh, autonomous driving. One look at the cloud, and here again, uh, you see that we have published some stuff on the, on the topic. I encourage you to go and read the paper, of course. Uh, let me quickly go to the next, uh, to the next uh, slides. This is uh, what I wanted to say. There is a story that's based again upon existing uh, systems, uh, building things from scratch. But the most important uh, operation, most important application for our distributed framework would be uh, the simulation. Whenever some new uh, simulation system, some new uh, algorithm has to uh, be implemented, it has to be simulated a large number of scenarios so that uh, uh, we have a good, good confidence that it is uh, working correctly. Uh, the original slide had a picture of uh, Beijing, and I asked my student to change it to a picture of Paris. Mm -hmm. I probably should have made it a map of Sao Paulo, but I think that uh, So the, the, the other uh, place on the, the, the reason why we want a, a good uh, cloud infrastructure would be the creation of uh, HD maps. Uh, that's going to be particularly useful if we were to deal with uh, LiDAR systems, but as I mentioned before, it can supplement a camera and vision based system. Okay, uh, so the case study, I think I may be able to finish some time here. The case study has to do with a very simple vehicle that ended up uh, driving about, uh, about 15 miles per hour. Uh, 
uh, it's the so-called dragonfly module here, the T thing that has a synchronized image with the complete stereo image uh, 360. Um, and it's embedded with the inertial unit in the GPS uh, with also real odometry. And you recognize what we discussed before, that's the implemented system that has been implemented. And uh, it, uh, as I mentioned before, it operates at about 15 miles per hour. So uh, it, there is uh, some progress to be made. And most likely, if you were to do the calculation, uh, complexity of computation grows not with the speed, but probably with the, the square of speed or something like that, maybe even exponential. The system is uh, Modular it is SLAM ready. We discussed SLAM earlier. It has low power consumption, 10 watt, and it allows us to uh, interpret four way uh, images at greater than 30 frames per second. And you see that we're still right up there in terms of computation, and more uh, effort is needed in order to make it really high speed, all terrain, all situation computations. Not going to drive our Mercedes at that speed. Okay, uh, so that's the you know, overall system of the Dragonfly PGA uh, based virtual uh, visual SIM uh, system. Um, some evaluation results to show us that indeed we have the speeds that we were expecting. And uh, what uh, the, the conclusions is we have a really tough problem on our hands. It is a problem that's both communication intensive, communication amongst the processors on our chip, and computation intensive. And if you correlate this with the next level, which would be communication with other vehicles around you, then uh, the problem is going to grow exponentially. But for the moment, that is not what we are discussing. Uh, it's going to require a good operating system. Uh, it needs absolutely heterogeneous computing and uh, it uh, requires some kind of optimization from the hardware side. So obviously autonomous driving is not one technology. I think uh, in the span of one hour, you have a good idea that we have quite a few different technologies that have come in together to uh, supplement, supplement, me, supplement each other. Uh, and then we need to harmoniously integrate them. We need to ignore the results of one when it's not satisfactory and conversely enhance the weight uh, in our preferences. Uh, the three major components you have seen, algorithms, client system, and cloud platform. Uh, those are the three major components and we must be able to integrate, we must excel at all three in order to make autonomous driving possible. With this, uh, I'd just like to uh, point uh, some future research. I'm not going to read this. Uh, you can see it in, my, in the notes that I will uh, make available. Um, that's for future work. Notice that we uh, have great communication system problems. And uh, there are some references that I've listed here. Again, I'm not expecting you to remember that. But you will find them in the notes. With this, I would like to open the floor for questions. Thank you. So, please, go ahead, questions. Uh, driving in California is too easy. Uh, driving is always a not completely different problem. Uh, you have any idea of? What would be the challenges here? Because when you describe these problems, I, I imagine the California scene. Why means few cars if you don't have crazy people jumping from the cars all the time? <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, sorry, crazy people jumping is possible. Not somehow. So, how would we have? No, same people, the same people, people jumping. <laughs> crazy motorcycles crossing. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah so it sounds like a lot of money to more complicated yeah. than that. Yeah, I mean, uh, Times Square at 5 p.m. on Friday afternoon uh, would be a horrendous problem. Or, or the Place de l'Etoile in Paris at the same time. Uh, 
probably be an order of magnitude. Uh, there's probably going to, to have to be uh, at some point some kind of a learning system where uh, some uh, some kind of crowdsourcing where drivers will take those vehicles and show them that's what this idiot is doing. Well, we don't need to put it quite that way, but learning by experience is probably something that we require. We didn't discuss that here. We just uh, everything was algorithmic based, based uh, or not quite, but I mean this kind of. Uh, of decision making is algorithm based rather than experience based. So maybe the algorithm would be to learn the culture of the city. That's right. It's driving. That's right. Do you see any problem if the, this, the vehicles communicate with each other and with the uh, server? Oh, yeah. So you can organize this. Well, uh, it, it, it could be a benefit too, you know, because uh, if the uh, the vehicle behind you tells you, I'm behind you, 50 feet behind you, then that kind of relieves some of your computation. Maybe I just suddenly, I don't have to look there, I don't have to analyze that part of the scene, or I don't have to analyze it as often. So it, 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 it could be actually, a, it could come in as a relief to your computational events. So yeah, there's going to be some, uh, uh, there are, uh, uh, the, 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 yeah, there are some some projects. I think it's called P two X that uh, that deal with communication communication with other vehicles. Yeah, there's a lot of things to be developed still. I think from your. Uh, I'm sorry, say again. There's still a lot of things to be developed oh, yeah. to get mm -hmm. construction. But I just wonder what is the conversion stage of a Tesla, for example, because I don't know. Really, there's not much Tesla vehicles that you can do, but uh, I suppose the the ones that are in the United States, they have a little bit of. A Driving yeah. or what? Uh, Audi, Audi also has some autonomous driving, but it's it tends to be single lane, uh, so it's like stop and go traffic. Uh, that, that's probably the state of the art of uh, wide uh, distribution. Yeah. Uh, just, uh, so there's not it's not really autonomous as human Well, it's semi-autonomous, you know, so you, you can work with it. No, you don't do that. <laughs> Uh, but the, the car at least will go uh, stop for you, which is uh, quite the annoying part. But, uh, there, there are some human computing uh, interaction uh, issues that we'll have to deal with, and probably the same things that we dealt with, and we're still dealing with um, in terms of airliners. The problem is we tend to. Uh, airliners they're so automated and we ask the computer to make the decisions and we ask the pilot to monitor the computer which is exactly the wrong thing because humans get bored and so they stop monitoring and computers if suddenly they are faced with a situation that they can't handle they'll throw their little hands in the air and say you do it remember the video to Paris uh, flight. Uh, it seemed to me that uh, most of the recent effort is on the vehicle, right? Um, put software, hardware on the vehicle. But I believe uh, we could redesign the highway to make uh, things work better. Let me give you an example. I was a graduate student, a PhD student. 40 years ago, and at Carnegie Mellon, and they had this uh, autonomous, autonomous vehicle. It's a van. It's in the one initial stage of the research. There was a van where, in which they put the, a war machine, the, six, the 16 processor machine, camera, and so on. And I, I went to see a demo, a demonstration. The ARPA people came to evaluate. And people are very excited because they nervous. And they put the, the land in motion with a driver just to make the law uh, obey. You know, you, you cannot have a, a vehicle without the driver. So driver, you can put the van. And the, 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 the idea is to make the van go up a road in Shelly Park. It's a small road. And uh, it, no, no, at the beginning, it went well. It slowly, very slow. And then all of a sudden, 
you see, the, the road is, uh, is black, and the outside road is uh, it's winter, so it's uh, kind of a green and brown. So the, 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 the vehicle was able to distinguish where it should go. Now it started to snow. Mm -hmm. It the snow made everything white. Mm -hmm. we, we were watching and the, the vehicles stopped. And everybody nervous because you cannot distinguish the road from the highway, I mean highway from the surrounding. And then after some time it started again. And other people, of course. What I want to say is, if you, if we could cover a uh, yeah. highway, the guardrail, or things on the boundary, the special cover, or put sensors on the the, the line that divide the several lanes, I, I I think it would make uh, your life much easier. Right? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think that's probably, research on this. I think that's probably what uh, what I was discussing. Uh, what RD does. Because not only do they do stop and go traffic, but they make sure that the car stays within the lanes. So that's for. I mean, you have to uh, invest a lot. I mean, the government. Well, in, in this case, you know, lanes are very well marked on the freeway. So that's uh, that's the state. Yeah, but you, if you could put sensor on, I mean, makes it much more easier and well, more, they make, uh, more safe. I think. Yeah, I mean, you could have uh, passive sensors or, or passive, uh, you know, like uh, reflectors. Uh, yeah, um, but uh, the, the investment is, uh, is the problem. And again, here, what we're trying to do is to have something that's all in, encompassing. It's going to be driving on any kind of road and yeah, yeah. some of that. Right. Right. And last year, the uh, AMAS conference of autonomous agents was organized here in Sao Paulo. Uh -huh. And Jeff Schneider came. He's, yeah. he's, he works with uh, our uh, vehicles in Carnegie Mellon, and he was on leave for Uber, uh, mm -hmm. related to Uber. And one issue we raised at the conference is that uh, normally uh, optimization of traffic, even for humans, isn't a cooperative or a competitive uh, task, meaning that everybody wants to help each other or not. So, if you think that you can have different uh, different vendors, for instance, a Google car, an Uber car, when the issue that was raised is whether a Google car would cooperate with a Google car, or mm -hmm. when communicating or, or, or doing things like that. Uh, another issue would be how um, you could try to foresee the behavior of these uh, cars uh, from a decision making point of view, uh, if you are uh, from different companies, for instance, we can imagine that Google cars will always take a path passing in front of that pizza that uh, even advertisements. So, there are some social issues that are related. That can be put in that uh, decision making box. Well, uh, I would like to hear your opinion. I'm going to go back to my earlier advertisement for the Computer Society and our standards efforts. Uh, the standards are, are made for just things like that, you know, people, people from different parts of the industry that will put themselves together because they know that success of their industry. Uh, comes from cooperating on those standards so that everybody, you know, the USB standard, or they all able to read them. Uh, now, this also touches upon ethical issues. Uh, so they, 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 yes, the answer is yes, this is a very good question. Uh, and uh, actually, I'm throwing it back at you. you. You have to come up with the, the groups that will form the standards that will answer the ethical questions. Okay, like. Um, uh, someone uh, was discussing you know, the, the usual thing. You, know, you have, you have an, in, an impending crash. You cannot avoid it. You know, there's one person. Here is there's two people. You know? So you choose the one or you choose the two. And then it gets better at least in my my tortured mind. Uh, this one is an older person. This one is a young person. Because so, you know, now you start. You have more uh, 
more computational power, you see the gray hair. Yeah, this one has lived long enough, you know, that uh, we have to have a decision. Uh, but then if you decide that suddenly this uh, uh, older person is Professor Goldman, you know, he's just about to have a Nobel Prize, and this person is young, but he just escaped from San Quentin. <laughs> <laughs> because you have face recognition, you know, so et cetera, et cetera. Uh, of course, I'm being facetious here, but there are a number of uh, multiple levels. As a matter of fact, I think uh, 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 Mercedes has solved the problem and it shocked people. They said, we have to protect the occupants of the car at all costs. Which means that if you see a van is driving on the road, you better. Go for the higher, the, the higher uh, terrain. Yes. Professor, uh, you said that in the first slides, you said that uh, it's still a bit difficult to work and it's not in the state of, uh, it's not practical yet. But we are hearing a lot that uh, Uber and uh, Tesla are using cars and yeah, they heard that uh, they were in an accident. But uh, they even have like, some kind of accident that the car didn't see the people. Right. So, is it still a science or it is in practice? It's still an art. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they're, they're, like you said, you know, we're not. Uh, again, we are back to the uh, to ethical and uh, standard considerations. Uh, what uh, you know, car uh, car accidents do occur with drivers. Dark drivers are not infallible. We got to understand. What is an acceptable level of risk? Uh, right now, we are demanding a lot. We are demanding perfection. Uh, that's but you're, but there's still a lot of work that can be done, and there is uh, a lot of uh, the, the, those Uber cars tend to be restricted to a certain area. We are trying to to, to be uh, all encompassing. Yeah. Okay, I have a good question, but uh, maybe well, they have all been. Questions. Mm -hmm. And uh, a quick one. Uh -huh. uh, let's see. Uh, let's go back to our field, our conference on HPC. We did some mistakes like Spectre and Knockdown. Why? We did not have this kind of security mindset when trying to reach performance. Mm -hmm. And what about this much more dangerous area of autonomous vehicles? What can you do about security? Uh, I don't even want to touch that. I'm not an expert in security. I know that the security issues are there. And you're right, we're going to have to address them. Uh, uh, security is everywhere. You know, like, uh, uh, even uh, when you get a new Microsoft operating system, you know who knows who has uh, gotten their, their hands in it, or what trapdoor there is inside. No, I, I don't know. It's a simple question, but the answer is very complex. And I don't know. Just a question. I saw some open source projects in the on my slides, and I would like to know more about how open source projects are helping. Well, in this case, they, they provide uh, they provide ready-made solutions on which we can build the rest of our system. That's, that's really all there is. But then uh, the security issues that uh, Fred mentioned come in. Okay. okay, just uh, one thing. As you were the last president of uh, IT Polycopter Society, I think here, what everybody is associated to IT Polycopter, your last message to the people that, uh, as former president, what do you can say? Join. <laughs> <laughs> Need to uh, uh, no 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 one is an island, as they say in American English. Uh, you need your colleagues to form communities, big communities, small communities, and the first step is in joining a professional society like a new society. I uh, will give you a number of examples, publications, standards, anything that you might be of interest. Uh, student chapters is also uh, something that uh, uh, really starts you off in your career. Several students in this university together, they start projects, they start organizing talks, they start 
maybe a newsletter, and then someone in India said, oh, hey, we've been working on that, uh, your, your web, if you will, starts growing from there. So, enjoy. Thank you. Thank you. Obrigado,